Uh, we do have one prisoner at Camp Campbell mm -hmm. who was shot and killed in an escape attempt. Really? So we do have that. And he's buried He's buried at Fort Campbell now, really? along with a couple other prisoners. So there's a little German POW cemetery there. But he is the only one that was killed from here at Camp Campbell. The, the story that went with that was he was being transferred for medical reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I don't know exactly what those medical reasons were, but he was under escort of a medical uh, attendant mm -hmm. and a American guard. And when he got to the train station, he decided the train was coming in. Was it this? The, the well, LNN station. The LNN station here yeah. in town, right So there. He, he attempted to, to run and the guard called out halt because there's, there's a rule, you have to call it halt mm -hmm. uh, twice. Uh, and he didn't stop. So the guard, I think, fired a warning shot and then fired an wow. actual shot and it killed him. So he died so in that escape. Joseph, Joseph Reidinger uh, is, is, is his wow. name. Most of these prisoners that do escape, there's nowhere really to go and yeah. they can't stay out there for long because they don't have any, they don't have currency, they don't have an understanding of where they're at. So we do have that situation that happened um, here at, at Camp Campbell, at Fort, uh, wow. Fort Campbell. Well, that's, it's just fascinating. And so I wanna say hello and welcome to Experience Austin P, the podcast dedicated to highlighting why this is the uh, premier university in the region. I'm Charles Booth, Director of Communication. I'm joined today by Dr. Antonio Thompson, yeah, Professor hello. of History. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, and we're continuing our <clears throat> first season of this podcast, which is called Forgotten Tennessee which is a perfect for this topic for what you do. So I'll just say right now, I'm a movie fan, and I particularly like World War II movies, and I like the subgenre of World War II escape movies like Stalag 17 and The Great Escape <laughs> and Chicken Run. And, uh, <laughs> but I think this is one of the great things about Austin P is that I had a preconceived notion. I only ever thought about US POWs in Europe. I never <clears throat> thought about that. And then, you know, all of a sudden here you come and say, hey, did you know that the German POWs were in the U.S.? Uh, and then there's a lot more. How, but how did you even find this subject? How did you, you discover this? Yeah, so this is it's kind of interesting. It started, I don't want to say how many years ago. <laughs> it started years ago. Right. But uh, when I was doing my master's degree, which was at Western Kentucky University. Because you're an Austin P alumnus with your bachelor's. Austin P was my bachelor's yes, degree. Yes, awesome. And, and I'm back at Austin P. But I did my master's degree at Western. And when you're doing your master's degree, one of the things, especially in history, you need to think about a thesis project. Mm -hmm. And you want to do something that, that you can do that's achievable in the amount of time you have, but that's unique. Something that hasn't been done. Um, so that's a challenge. Right. And I was sitting in one of my classes, and sometimes, as, as we know, professors come in before class starts, and there's a little bit of, you know, back and forth yeah, chatter. A little banter. Yeah, a little yeah. banter. And he mentioned, just in that moment, he just mentioned, and I don't remember why, yeah, there was uh, German POWs that escaped in Bowling Green, and was, which is where Western is. Right. And I thought to myself, well, I'm a World War II person, and I'm looking for a World War II subject at the moment. Yeah. And I never had heard that. And I'm, I'm basically from Kentucky. Yeah. This is news to me. It's like an hour away. So, yeah. So that's, there was a seed. That yeah. was where the seed was planted. So how many, how many POWs came to the U.S.? Because, it's like, again, it's something I never thought of. Yeah, so it's a really weird sort of uh, even number. We look at and we consider 425,000 wow. POWs. Now, when we break that down... 371,000 of that number are Germans. 50, some odd, 51, 52,000 are Italian. And then I think in the neighborhood of 5,500, I don't have that stuff right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. But 5,500 are Japanese POWs. Wow. So the vast majority of the prisoners are German, German. prisoners that we bring from European or North mm -hmm. African or Atlantic uh, you know, naval battles to the U.S. So I guess I, if I had thought about it at all, I would have thought they would, you know, all would have just remained in Europe. But we're sending our, this is World War II, 1940s, we're sending, you know, our soldiers over to Europe, and then we're capturing uh, prisoners and sending them back to the U.S., and they're coming to places like Tennessee and Kentucky. 
you have to have the prisoners somewhere where they can be kept safely. So during an active back and forth war. Uh, so initially, for the Europeans, that would be in North Africa. Uh, we do have temporary camps set up, but that's not going to work permanently. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to resolve that problem when we drop off supplies or drop off reinforcements or what have you. Those ships have to come back, and typically they might have wounded personnel or something else, but typically yeah. they're going to be generally empty. So we can fill those with prisoners of war. Wow. So we're not paying necessarily extra. Right. We're bringing them here. Once here, during the war, we have a major manpower shortage, especially in agriculture, because able-bodied people are serving the military right. in some capacity or the military industry mm -hmm. in some capacity, and that's pulling people from our farms. So we're going to put the prisoners to work to replace those workers. So they're going to, long story short, they're going to pay for their upkeep. So they come to Tennessee, and I'm assuming most of them are farm workers? Are they all over the state? Are they in one area? No. So they are farm workers. Mm -hmm. And in Tennessee, the, the number one crop that, that we're going to be focused on, and really our cash crop especially of that time and you know probably to this time even, right. is tobacco. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to look at tobacco, which if that crop fails, it's going to— it's not just going to devastate local farmers. It's going to have a, an effect on the state economy. It's going to have an effect on the national economy. We're also going to have them work in corn. Mm -hmm. We're going to have, so these are the second largest thing, but they're also going to do other farm labor jobs throughout, throughout the seasons, right. wh whatever might arise. But your number one and two is tobacco and corn. They didn't do the bad things we thought they would do to Americans. Right. But there is a segment of prisoners that committed violence upon other prisoners. Oh, so, wow. so there are behind the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of friction that's taking place, and it leads to murders, it leads to beatings, it leads to threats, forced suicides. Wow. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, it has to do largely with. We, when we think of Germany, we often say, and you and I talked about this before we mm -hmm. started the interview about Nazis. Right. Well, there are actual Nazis, and the actual Nazis, people who hold membership in the Nazi party, right. control these internal operations, and a fairly large number of the men in German uniform, and I call them that for a specific reason, mm -hmm. are not Nazis, and they don't follow the party line, and that creates problems where these groups oh. do not get along. Wow. So, so the Nazi element, sometimes the more radical of mm -hmm. that element, will resort to physical intimidation, threats, and physical violence right. upon the prisoners. And, and we realize that as Americans. We realize that's happening. It takes a little while, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, it takes some, some beatings and some deaths. But then we start segregating out wow. those, those prisoners. So the Nazi element of the prisoners over here, yeah. the men in German uniforms, they might be Austrian, they might be German, yeah. they might, yeah. Yeah, so we basically look at it like this. Uh, the hardcore Nazis get put to, mm -hmm. to their own camps. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest of those is in Oklahoma, okay. uh, Camp Alva, Oklahoma. And then we have the more radical anti-Nazis, the most outspoken or at-risk element that are put into their own camps, and this might go right into our, our interview, yeah. one of those camps is Camp Campbell. Oh. So, yeah. So, Camp Campbell's one. And then the vast majority, uh, sometimes we call them gray or neutral, mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're talking about 5 to 15 percent radical Nazi, 5 to 15 percent radical anti-Nazi. So, that leaves the, the vast 70, this is a rough math, but yeah. 70 percent somewhere in the middle, right? Just... I'm doing my thing. I don't. I right. don't want to run afoul of the dangerous group, or I don't want to be associated necessarily with mm -hmm. with this group either. So we're we're over here, and once you start isolating the two radical yeah. sides, generally speaking, things are gonna gonna get better. Right now, you could imagine uh, you're in a prison for years. There's the random interpersonal conflict, but the organized conflict kind of 
starch to simmer down. It's not a perfect science. Yeah. Right? These, we don't always get everyone that goes to one group. They, mm -hmm. they sometimes get mixed in still. There's problems. It's not perfect. But the effort, yeah. a little late, but the effort was there. So you brought up Camp Campbell. We're yeah. here at Austin P. in Clarksville, and right next to us is Fort Campbell. But before it was Camp Campbell, it was farmland. Okay. So, and that was land that was taken from locals from Kentucky and Tennessee, because mm -hmm. we, we know as a, as being in Tennessee, yeah. is it Fort Campbell, right. Kentucky, Clarksville Fort Campbell. is like the center of a Venn diagram between <laughs> Southern Kentucky and Northern Tennessee. <laughs> right. So, um, and we have land taken from uh, Montgomery County, Stewart County, mm -hmm. uh, Trigg County, and Christian County to, to create Camp Campbell. Camp Campbell is created as one of our camps to prepare us for World War II. Okay, wow. So it gets its, World War II mm -hmm. is where Camp Campbell and in Kentucky Camp Breckenridge and other camps like that, uh, uh, Camp Forest. Yeah. So these, World War II, the need to get military trained and ready for combat and overseas duty, whether we're going to the European or Pacific theater, that's the birthplace of these things. Wow. So Camp Campbell gets started directly because mm -hmm. of World War II. Camp Campbell had 3,000 POW population, which is the average base camp size. Now, the way that these camps work, it's 3,000, a compound of 1,000, a compound of 2,000, a compound of 3,000, okay. you know, next to each other, sort of sharing what we, what we might call the same campus. Right. Right? Uh, you're separated by barbed wire, but during the day there, there's some mingling, mm -hmm. you're working, these sort of things. But Camp Campbell, it wasn't that way. So Camp Campbell had three compounds. So first off, all three of them weren't built at the exact same time, but also they didn't neighbor each other. They were set across post. Oh, okay. So at the farthest extent between two of the compounds was roughly five miles apart. Wow. So what that enabled Camp Campbell to do mm -hmm. was to classify each compound a certain way. So like I said, Alva, Oklahoma was for extreme Nazis. Right. You could call the different compounds different things. So what we ended up doing at Camp Campbell was we said it's essentially, it's essentially a Nazi camp. The first compound is for Nazis. Okay. The other two compounds are for anti-Nazis. We tried our best to keep that a secret. The reason is we had previous anti-Nazi camps, mm -hmm. and Nazis, Nazi POWs tended to infiltrate those. Wow. There's a number of ways you can do that. Yeah. I'm being threatened. I need out of here. Oh, okay. I'm, my colleagues are there. I'm, I'm in danger because right. of that. So then they're like, well, we gotta get this guy out. And then they put you into the anti compound. And so these things happen. They get a paper, they write down everybody's name. Oh man. And they say, well, I'm gonna report you all. I'm gonna write a letter home to Germany. Uh, everybody knows what this camp is, who's in this camp. And now you can let me mm -hmm. out because I, I don't actually belong here. I belong back in the other camp. So it creates a danger because there's a danger immediately to those prisoners Mm -hmm. who are in these camps, but it's a potential danger to their families back home. Oh, right. They under, still have families. I didn't even think about they that. They have yeah. families back home under the Nazi regime. Right. So it's sort of, we might not be able to get you right now. You're in this anti-Nazi camp. You're kind of protected. But we, for your disloyalty, right. we can, we can the long arm of wow. the Nazi regime can reach your family. So it's threats like that. And sometimes uh, it's those threats that you will see uh, where they say this is if you if you take care of if you take care of the problem, we don't have to write a letter home. So sometimes huh. people commit suicide, and we're oh, not always positive, yeah. but we we're pretty sure it's it's related to they this. Were, now those are those are few those are few, but right. but not non-existent either. Some of these stories, some of these stories from Germans and Americans, mm -hmm. it's just incredibly interesting. And a lot of these guys that the Germans talk about their path to the military, like you have this impression of how they got there. There's a lot of conscripting, a lot of drafting, a lot right. of you know forced service, and these are young. They're young people when when they're being taken. One of the people I interviewed was 17 years old when he was taken. Wow. And if if you look at 
the book that I have coming out, I talk about these escapes. And some of these escapes are, well, they're simple. They're just, I walked away from my job. But some are outlandish. They're just outlandish. But when you look at the ages, mm -hmm. they're 17. They're 18. They're 20, right? Right. And, you know, when I first started, <laughs> when I first started doing this, I was like, all right, so they're, they're 20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now I say, well, my college students, that's the age. Yeah. My children, <laughs> that's that age. Yeah. I was that age. And, you know, you're, you're held in captivity and you want to get out for whatever reason. And sometimes you do some stupid things. And yeah. when I say stupid things, one group stole a, a Jeep, one group stole an ambulance. Wow. So I uh, hear at Fort Campbell, or Cam at Camp Campbell at the time, they stole an ambulance. I'm getting off of your question. No, but this is good. Research, but we're segueing into Well, this is great. So, stuff. like, there were escape attempts here. Oh, yeah. Ambulances yeah. And yeah. So there, there were escape attempts here at Camp Campbell. Uh, a group of prisoners stole an ambulance from the post and were driving it off post. Wow. And it was like 2 a.m., 2 or 3 a.m. And the MP was sitting there probably not much else happening right then. Right. So he noticed an ambulance with no lights on. <laughs> and then these guys pulled over and they were putting water in the radiator. And so he's watching this and thinking, well, I'm a little, it's a little suspicious. So yeah. he, he calls it in, no ambulance was dispatched. So he goes over, like four escaped prisoners, wow. and he tells them, drive that thing back and I'll follow, I'll follow you back in. So, you know, things like that yeah. happen. So the war, 45, the war's over. What? We got all these prisoners. Yeah, so in 1945, so the war is going to end with Germany in mm -hmm. May. And the Germans think that they're going to go home. Yeah. Well, the war against Japan is, is not over. So, you, so sorry, guys, you're not going to go home because mm -hmm. all of we can't ship you home when we need those resources right. yeah. to, to, take, to, to finish what we're doing. So... By the fall of 45, what we start doing is we do start shipping the prisoners. Now, the Ita this is Germans. The Italians, we've got another story about the Italians. But we start shipping the Germans back to Europe. Because of a deal we made with the Western Allies, the prisoners that were being shipped from the U.S. to Europe didn't go to Germany. They went to France. They went to Great Britain. And they went to some of the other Western countries to help uh, rebuild, to uh. help damage. So essentially, they remained prisoners of war from, 40, from late 45, mm -hmm. 46, into 47. In some cases, there's a few accounts as late as 1949, they're still being held prisoner. But there's a second group. So in the U.S., we start sending them home in the fall, but the 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 larger number, it's, it's more into the winter, in mm -hmm. the winter, December, and then into January of 46, we're sending them home. But there's a second group, a smaller group, who go through a very illegal re-education program uh, where we're trying to denazify you. Mm -hmm. If you went through that program, an unknown benefit to you as the prisoner, and I'm not sure it was known immediately either to anybody, but this develops later, is that you got to go directly to Germany. So this re-educated group, uh, to put a number on it, I, I'm not sure mm -hmm. without having my numbers here, but probably less than 40,000, but I know for sure greater than 28,000 were, were went through the re-education program. They went directly to Germany. Their goal is to help work with the occupation government. So we train them for administrative roles, for police roles, gotcha. and they're gonna help the American, and sometimes the British occupation yeah. zones. But they're gonna also have jobs. And for post-World War II Europe, especially war-torn Germany, that's, that's, it might not be what you wanted, right? But it's a pretty good deal yeah. in the reality of it's the, the situation. Best you can get, probably. It's probably the yeah. best you can get because we've got a lot of these guys riding home, or not riding home, riding back here mm. from home, telling the old farm families, we're broke. Can you send food? Can you send clothes? Can you send boots? So they're asking for stuff. Yeah. But some of those 
individuals felt very, very betrayed because they were under the impression that we were going to also go to Germany, but instead we're being placed into these other countries. Wow. And a lot of the stories, the Germans and the French, uh, f under the French hands, is a different situation. Yeah. It's not in American hands. Right. Uh, but, of course, Soviet Union captivity, they held prisoners yeah. even longer. So Germans wow. held over there. Those that got released, they were held even longer. But so, yeah, so that's what it looked like going home. And the camps would slowly, mm -hmm. they would slowly close. They would slowly close and sort of consolidate. Yeah. So as one camp moved everybody out, they would shut it down and then maybe transfer to these other camps and close stuff down. And so very quickly, you're losing your tobacco labor, you're losing yeah. your corn labor, but civilian, the military coming back home, they're being discharged, they're, they're transiting to the civilian sector. The war industry is slowing back down. Yeah. So you're going back into into this situation. So you theoretically should not need, mm -hmm. the, you have time now to transition back. So that's that's sort of how that looked. But did you say that they were writing back, like the POWs who were here, who are back in Germany or wherever they are, are writing back to their... Yeah. People yeah. In so yeah, they they, they formed friendships. They, they, they certainly did. So oh. the prisoners, keep in mind, come and that's what in men in German uniform I yeah. talk about specifically. They're not all German. First off, they and German are included in this group, obviously. Yeah. But they're not all German. They're Austrian. They're Polish. They're they're Czechoslovakia. At the time of Czechoslovakia, they're they're some of them are French. They they come from everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some cases, and we've got two good examples I can share with you in Kentucky. It's, the, it's in Trick County, the Broadbent family. And in Tennessee, it's in Lawrenceburg. But you've got, in both cases, really, this, this core of prisoner laborers that work for these two families. Mm -hmm. And the Stribling Brock family in Lawrenceburg and the Broadbent family in, in Trick County, Cadiz. And they work for multiple seasons with this family and they eat with them because they serve lunches, they serve yeah. dinners sometimes. They do Christmas celebrations, just just a lot of over years getting to know each other. So when these people go back, they correspond. And there's, in some cases, in these two cases, there's a vigorous correspondence. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the Trick County case, which is, Trick County is where I went to high school at, so I, I kind of know this. When I looked at POWs and I found out, oh, Camp Campbell, Trick County, that was an immediate, let's see what's happening right. here. So, like, and I talked with the Broadbent family. Oh. They had uh, a collection of letters and Christmas cards and all sorts of things gathered over the years of, uh, <laughs> so it was the one-sided correspondence because, yeah. of course, they wrote the other way, but they had all the return correspondence yeah, yeah. here. Now, this story ends... I don't want to say really interesting for like the 14th time on no. this thing. But what happens is, was it the 1960s? The former Austrian POWs, because the Broadbents had like 20 guys that were all happened to be from Austria, mm -hmm. said, why don't you all come to Austria and we will tour you around our country. Wow. So they took them up on that. <laughs> so the Broadbent family went over there and... When the prisoner, for whatever a former prisoner and spouse or what the case might be, was not maybe in a physical position to tour them ailment or whatever, mm -hmm. a family member did it. So they went and got sort of this guided tour of Austria by these people wow. who were formerly prisoners. So one of the things, uh, when I was doing my, my PhD, so this is another come full circle story. Yeah. <clears throat> I was looking to interview people who were involved. So in Lexington, which is right where the University of Kentucky is at, neighboring community of Richmond, mm -hmm. one of the guys that lived there had worked as a civilian on a farm in Christian County with where POWs worked. Yeah. So I met him and we became very good friends. And as we're interviewing for, he's unfortunately he's passed away now, okay. but as we were interviewing, he, we talked about many different stories, but one story, he joined the military here at Fort Campbell. He served in the Special Forces. And part of his military time, he was stationed in Germany. So 
He had one of those old radios where they had the transistor tube yeah. set, and I didn't have one of these. <laughs> but they, <laughs> you seem very familiar I, with. Yeah, those. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have one now. Right. But where the 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 tubes blow all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> so he had to go locally because on the on the army base he mm -hmm. didn't have one. So he had to go locally, and go to an electronic shop, and everyone there spoke German. So he there was the communication wasn't working because he right. didn't speak. He spoke English only. So they went and got the owner, and the owner was an older gentleman at that time. And he spoke English. And this man said, well, how did you learn such good English? He's like, well, I served in the German military in World War II. I was a prisoner of war at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. No. And I worked on farms in Christian County. So they got to talk. He's like, well, I'm from Christian right. County. So they got to talking. He's confident that this, he couldn't say 100% right. sure, but confident he was one of the prisoners that worked on his family's farm. That he, as wow. a teenager, worked on also as a as a young teenager, yeah. worked on. When I say young teenager, I don't remember. He's thirteen, maybe twelve, but he had mm -hmm. older siblings too. So, th regardless, he was at Fort Campbell, right? Which and this guy was serving at Fort Campbell currently, and he's from the area. So it's one of those full circle stories. That's amazing. And here's one that it's not original to me, mm -hmm. but I, in my research, I discovered one of one of the soldiers was. Wounded, one of our soldiers, one of American soldiers was wounded, and he wasn't sure what was going to happen. The Germans came to capture him, and the sergeant of the group spoke English and said, Where are you from? Mm -hmm. He said, I'm from Fort Campbell. He said, My brother is being held prisoner there. Wow. So, and he felt like that, because he didn't know, it's conjecture, right? He didn't yeah. know what was going to happen next. But anything could have happened next, yeah. and that, that changed the situation for him, like somehow that connection. So wow. it's, it's just these small, these small weird Right, so weird you've got things. all these, you just keep collecting these stories. You're meeting people and getting yeah. the personal on-the-ground view of what the war was like uh, over here in Tennessee, over up here in Kentucky. Yeah. You know, this is just amazing. Yeah, it's, to me, like, again, 15th time, maybe 16th for counting, but it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And I love it, so yeah. it's great. Yeah, that's right. So we've got the, the first book, well, let's back up. You wrote originally a book years ago. You have five books. Yeah, so there's five that I have out. But the first th about this topic was men in German uniform. No, was it? it was the there was the German jackboots, which was yeah. on German jackboots on Kentucky bluegrass, which was the story of the POWs in Kentucky. Wow! And it's very, I should say, directly on the POWs. So mm -hmm. the book I have coming out is a broader, it's a bigger book on Kentucky. Right. It's about Kentucky itself, the Kentucky economy, the Kentucky communities. Prisoners are the are the main subject, yeah. but how their work impacted the economics and the people oh, wow. and the society. So they so had an influence. They had, yeah. they had this greater influence on the state. So I have two books coming out. So I have five now All published, right. but I have two coming out. One's on Tennessee and one's on Kentucky. They both are prisoner of war. They're very state-specific. Yeah. And when I wrote these books, I wanted to... And hopefully, if you read it, you'll agree. We'll see. But I wanted to say the prisoners of war, they didn't happen in a vacuum. Yes, they have their story, mm -hmm. but they're working, they're interacting, they're influencing. You know, from even the escape thing, we have a sort of a, what we'd call today a paranoia, but at the time, yeah. a legitimate concern to, okay, maybe over concern, but we didn't know. So all of that escaping, working, interacting, yeah. it's a whole story, right? The POW labor helped that local economy. The local economy helped the state economy. The state economy helped the national economy. So wow. that's what I'm trying to, to put with these two books. Yeah. So you read the Kentucky one or the Tennessee one, it's very much a state history, but I look lower at the local level, I look higher at the national level, and then I say, all this obviously, obviously, Mm -hmm. had an influence on World War II. Wow. So, like, the state economics were largely saved yeah. because both of these states are tobacco-driven economies. They're agricultural-driven mm -hmm. economies, so corn also, but tobacco and then corn, right? Yeah. It's saved by this labor because this labor is happening in 1943, 44, and 45. 
a little bit of labor into early 46, but we're not talking tobacco harvesting at that time. Okay. But the t tobacco harvesting seasons of 43, 44, and 45, particularly 44 and 45, you will find numerous uh, statements that the prisoner labor saved the crops, that the crops mostly would have been wasted. That would have damaged mm -hmm. the economy of these states Right. at, at a time when manpower was was essential we're in a really a really bad position with manpower so our plan to put these prisoners to work and they didn't just work in agriculture they worked in other sectors they worked on the military bases too mm -hmm. doing all sorts of jobs all sorts of jobs from basic repair to uh working in they worked in the mess hall washing dishes just, yeah. just jobs that someone needed to do we didn't and have if, someone for it and if they yeah. weren't there it would it would be either a civilian employee mm -hmm. or a military employee to do it so we're replacing that labor yeah. that's allowing that civilian to work in a warrior because prisoners couldn't work in a war direct mm -hmm. war industry they could only anything that would directly like in, that. well anything that yeah. would directly influence the war right. anything that directly would they're not allowed to do so uh, they couldn't for instance repair jeeps so if mm -hmm. it, if it's an army jeep that might go overseas yeah. they couldn't work on it so they're freeing up people to do that job yeah. and so that's that's a pretty a pretty big thing when you have you know 400 or or 350 because not every one of them worked but a lot, the large majority of them very quickly being put into mm -hmm. the labor field and saving these crops. And it wasn't just Kentucky and Tennessee. They did it all across the country, wow. saving whatever that region's local yeah. crops were, working in lumber. They did lumber here, too, working mm -hmm. in lumber. So in Tennessee, there's a lot of pulp wood, things like that. Uh, little bit of, a little bit of cotton because POWs in Memphis were taken over to Arkansas where they would oh, wow. work, uh, okay. work a little bit of cotton over there, too, from the Memphis ASF Depot right. that was there. Wow. So, so the first book is uh, uh, Axis Prisoners of War in Tennessee. Yeah, the first, yeah in, in Kentucky. Oh, the new ones, the, the new ones. Yeah, yeah. The new ones. I'm sorry. Axis Prisoners of War in, in Tennessee, and it should be available. I don't know if it's for pre-order yet, yeah. but it should be available in November of this year. Ooh, so awesome. November Excellent. 2022. Uh, Axis prisoners of war in Tennessee coerced coerced labor. Coer yeah. On on the home front. Coerced la co coerce labor on the home front. Yeah. 19, I think 1943 to 1946. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, if you're at all fascinated with, you know, U.S. history, you know, World War II history, Tennessee history. This has just got to be a staple to get. And then we have the Kentucky book. Yeah. Uh, it seems like it's a lot of, you've been busy? I've been, it? yeah, I've been very busy. Uh, <laughs> it's It's been extraordinarily busy. And you know, I think it's a labor of love. I mean, this has been a lot of work. Is there another POW in America you, book? You know, I want to I wanna catch my breath. Yeah. And uh, there will be something. And I might not be POWs because there's other, there's other things I do. And we, we mentioned one of them a minute ago. I don't know if I'm going on that road again either, but um, well, I, I will don't just, know. I will just say that you've uh, edited and wrote a, you with your uh, wife, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Dr. Amy, Amy Thompson, which yep. is not at all confusing <laughs> when you're trying to email one of y'all with both A. Thompsons. Yeah, Thompson A is and yeah. the Thompson A.S. Yeah. Uh, who uh, in the, the, the Department of Biology, but y'all yeah. uh, had this amazing book, uh, But If a Zombie the Apocalypse Did Occur, <laughs> which was a sort of a, a scholarly look at sort of how the world would work in a situation like a pandemic, which when this came out, there was no... Yeah. The word pandemic wasn't as used as I use it every day now. <laughs> it's an everyday thing. Right. Yeah, it was, we did that in 2015. And uh, it's, also, it's also with McFarland, which is where my two, oh. my two new books are okay, with McFarland. Perfect. Yeah. So, and that's good. We have, we have a working relationship, mm -hmm. and that's always a, a good thing. And, and I want to say on record... I'm I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased with with that relationship. We've it's yeah. we've worked a lot right. together over the years, but I'm happy. But yeah, in 2015, the 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 idea of the pan zombies were popular. The idea of the pandemic, yeah, that was what's like this will never this can never happen, and uh, unfortunately, and it did. Yeah, and that's the world we we live in now. Mm -hmm. Dr. Thompson, I really appreciate you talking with us today. 
Uh, this has just been amazing. So the books are coming out. Uh, Keep an eye out. They'll be able to find them on Amazon yeah, or on, McFarland. On Amazon, McFarland will have that. I, I'm pretty sure that the first book is going to be November, but I can double check and I'll and I'll contact you and let you know. But soon, yeah, it'll be soon for the Tennessee book, Perfect. and then the Kentucky book. If I if I had to project, probably late spring of 2023. So maybe right. May. Around around that neighborhood. Perfect, and they'd be a great compliments to each other since we're right here. And you know, you know yeah. I would sign it if you were local. I'd sign it. All so. right, I'll get you. I'll get you to sign my copy. Uh, uh, are you are you doing any readings or anything? I mean, I know it's early since the books aren't out. Uh. Oh, so I have I have a couple of commitments coming up. I'm going to do a talk in Christian County mm -hmm. on on the Kentucky topic. Awesome. And I did a talk back in the summer in Madisonville, mm -hmm. and they've asked me to do a three-peat next year. Wow. So they want me to come three times in awesome. 2023. So, uh, and that was on POWs. And uh, I'm really, they're, they're really, yeah. that was a really good audience. And they enjoyed, obviously, what, yeah. what I was talking about. So I'm really happy about that. And I'm looking forward to, well, to coming out there. I mean, it's fascinating. I, I could literally sit here for another four or five hours. So yeah. I really appreciate it. Thanks <laughs> for coming out. Uh, thank you uh, for listening uh, to our podcast, The Experience Austin P. Thank you to Sean McCauley, our producer here. And we'll see you with a new episode soon. Yeah, thanks. I want to say thanks for everybody. Thanks for having me. It's, yeah. it's been a pleasure. So uh, really great time. Thank you so All much. All right, awesome. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right, now we can hit record. All right, yeah. Oops. <laughs>